So now, uh, I'm going to, going to talk to you about this topic. You, I, what I also would really welcome warmly are the questions from you. We can talk later on, just to, I'll get ask questions because they always help me as well when I do go further in the study of this, this theme. Um, maybe, maybe first I, I, I could just add a couple of words at how this all actually started. And it was some years ago, okay, now well maybe a bit more than some years, but, the, uh, but some years ago, let's say, when I was particularly studying uh, epigraphical material relating to cultic regulations in that case, and then I started wondering the fate of, uh, of the very often occurring dermata, the skins of the, uh, of the sacri sacrificial animals, which are often mentioned uh, as a obviously very significant pre uh, prerogative, a kind, kind of a salary or, uh, or honor honor honorific portion to the priests, priestesses, or other important uh, cultic personnel. Since the focus of the of, uh, a focus in the scholarship of ancient Greek sacrifice, which, which of course is the very in the very core of the study of ancient Greek cult in general, the focus has been on meat and sequences of the presentation of various meaty parts of the sacrificial animals, their distribution, their cutting the parts, and so on. We have very uh, much and very sophisticated studies on this. So. That's why it is rather surprising that the handling and the further use of the skins has very rarely been addressed. This actually opened up the whole world of uh, skins and leathers in ancient Greece to, to me, uh, this team which I will introduce you tonight. They actually start, if, you, if, we, if we open up uh, the type of leather eyes, the reading or seeing the material that we have, they suddenly start turning up everywhere. They are in all kinds of material, kind of sources that, that we have. And I'm going to just show you a couple of examples uh, this evening. They, they, they figure in mythology. Let's see that if we can, yeah. Uh, the skins, as we all know, they, um, and they, they figure as important attributes to mythological personae, for instance. Actually, I, I almost cannot help you uh, just right now in the beginning to, uh, to tell you a little anecdote uh, from, the, uh, from the Iliad, the so-called Doloneia. It is the, uh, it's the part where uh, the Greek, Greek warriors are, the war is not going really well. And uh, the big heroes are actually worried. Uh, Agamemnon is sleepless. He is a sleepless of worry that how the war is going to, going to be. And the others, they decide to have a meeting. So they turn up to this meeting in this Dolonea in the Iliad, all are sporting different kinds of skins. Agamemnon, as the, a, of course, as a primus inter pares, uh, he, he comes there wearing a large lion skin. Menelaus is threatened into leopard skin, etc., uh, etc. Et and the Greek party meets, uh, meets soon after an enemy, which was person per personified in Dolon. Uh, he's, he's a sneaky Trojan spy. He was then, of course, dressed up rather impressively. He was, he was wrapped in a full gear of grey wolf belt and sporting a gap of, uh, of a ferret kind of a weasel, ictis. So, of course, you can see already from here that the skins are not accidental. The animals chosen there, uh, they symbolize something. They bear meanings uh, and provide synecdotes. So then, see, skins and hides were not, of course, to be wasted in ancient uh, Greece. Of course, in ancient, okay, neither so in ancient Rome. Uh, because they could be turned into leather, and they were turned into leather. Leather was needed everywhere, by everyone. It, uh, it has actually, for reason, been called antiquities plastic, because uh, we can think of transporting uh, liquids, leather, leather equipment in seafaring, in army, in agriculture, in clothing, particularly in shoes, sandals, it was, it, it was a necessity. And, and uh, leather was a part of daily life. Obviously, then, of course, the question is, 
uh, why do we know so little about leather production patterns and procedures in ancient Greece? Why has tanning uh, often despised and uh, uh, discarded uh, activity been in one way shunned away in the scholarship of ancient, Greeks, uh, ancient Greece? Yeah, here you see a couple of examples how we do have, a, have a leather in different materials. Uh, and nevertheless, we do come, come across leather in all the categories of our sources. Textual ones, uh, we're going to hear about them. Visual ones, you see a couple of examples here. Archaeological, and also in various, various uh, categories of material evidence. Um, in the text, numerous leather items, from leather curtains to leather fallacies, for instance, in Aristophanes, abound. And in our text and visual sources, especially shoes, actually, have attracted much, uh, even recent scholarship. And this is about leather. But what is lacking is how do we end up into leather from skins? What happens between skin and leather? So where are there, then, the tanneries in ancient ancient Greece. Where is the tanning? I think that one of the reasons uh, could be that tanning, a smelly and in one way full activity, falls outside the traditional domains of ancient Greek production patterns. Manufacture of ceramics, metals, fabrics, and daily consumables, uh, which we know a lot. We have uh, kilometers of literature for those. They tend to be privileged uh, as the more cultured aspects of Greek life. And interestingly, tanning, uh, tanning doesn't belong there, even though leather seems to have been very much used. But also it's interesting that tanning has been much more explicitly integrated into the fabric of the ancient Roman life in the research tradition. Uh, and we know relatively much about large industrial uh, scale Roman leather production uh, units, particularly the further, further up north you go, the more tanneries uh, we tend to, tend to have. Also, a Roman soldier, for instance, uh, having his leather gear is a commonplace prototypal image, even, even to us, but not so in Greece. Scantiness of our archaeological record rela relating to ancient Greek tanning may be also a uh, result of a lack. Uh, of interest in Greek tanning, which in turn uh, is related to the lack of criteria for identifying Greek tanning establishment archaeologically. The reasons for a thin basis of uh, tanning knowledge in the research of ancient Greece may also be due to cultural and social, uh, social uh, uh, criteria, I mean, um, uh, reasons there. And it is here here, where archaeological, where, where historiographical, sorry, approach becomes informative. As a profession, tanning has been lowly regarded over the centuries, yet, con yet rather controversially, it has also been valued as a necessary trade, a source of revenue, and as a manufacture, uh, and as a manufacture which requires skills and training. And I, I really do think that we have to introduce leather making knowledge into the, as an important production pattern also to the study of ancient Greek, uh, ancient Greek antiquity. Here in the Roman side, you are a bit better off. So I'm just quickly going to show you that, that what, uh, what are we going to do this evening? Uh, I'm, uh, uh, before that, some other visual categories of leather. This is, of course, a very iconic example here you know, that, that we have. This is from a bathroom, one of the met, met, south metopes. Met, met you see the skin is there. This, in this case, it's a trophy. But, the, but, but, but this is exactly just to, just to kind of introduce you to opening the leather eyes in, uh, uh, for, for this evening. So I'm going to go quickly through the, uh, the, uh, the themes relating to terminology. Then, uh, then I'm going to tell you what actually happens in the, in the tanning, uh, the procedure which turns skins into leather. Uh, then we will have a look uh, quickly about the tanning in, uh, and sacrificial contexts. 
uh, location of the tanneries and the tanning archaeology to, uh, to finish with. So there we go. Uh, no, it is important to make a distinction uh, which is significant in all the stages and aspects of leather production, and it is that the skin is not leather. Uh, tanned and treated leather is further removed from its original living animal and becomes an anim inanimate sub substance and commodity. So, roughly, the skin is more living, leather is dead. Uh, this dichot dichotomy may explain the difficulty we have in connecting leather to its origin in living skin and in our uh, unwillingness uh, even to make an association between the two. This is also reflected in terminology relating to height, skins, and leather uh, products in Asian Greece. So there you see uh, the skin of, uh, of all the animals consists of three layers, which you see there. There are only two exceptions where the, the three layers are in all the, okay, all the even, not, even non mammals have, have the basic, basically the same. There's the difference is how the hair tract goes, and, and the two, so human and pigs, which make, it, make an exception uh, apart from the, from the other ones. There you see uh, for, for leather, the, that layer, uh, dermis layer is used, and it then consists of dif different layers. It's also important to have in mind that skins and heights, uh, skins uh, and heights, uh, and furs, um, and leather are not to be mixed with one another. And in Greek term, um, antiquity, difference between skins and hides on one hand and leather on the other was, in, uh, was indicated in various uh, ways, which can be read in terminology and context. Um, Greek terminology, the skins and hides on one hand and the leather on the other is a very rich and nuanced. The distinction between unprocessed, uh, which means not tanned, skin and processed, meaning tanned skin, uh, tanned leather is re reflected when hide skins and leather are described in, in the text and epigraphical material. You see here this one way, there's not that there's just a couple of examples there, uh, uh, how we go from raw hides, which are of course those, uh, those types that come from an animal, such as the freshly uh, flight uh, or, or, salt, or, or salted preserved, uh, on um, tanned uh, hides. So there's a, there's a there's own, own terminology for those. The most we, we have the most usual uh, derma is the generic term. Uh, bursa, bursa as you see there uh, refers to a raw ox hide. You see there's a, there's of course the animal in a, a embedded in the term. Um, then we have terms like rhinos. Rhinos is something that often is on a living animal. With the, with the fur still on. So there are texts which, uh, which describe different, kind of different animals, uh, and then, then the, this term is used. Skulos is, uh, skulos is quite rare, but it is raw height, it is, it is still kind of a living, and then uh, uh, very rare uh, stethros, as you see there, only a couple, of, uh, a couple of occurrences for that. And then there's a the special case, human skin, haros. Um, the, the, the Greek terminology also makes difference between pelts, furs, and fleeces. So, so those skins or, uh, or furs which still have, uh, have, have the retains the hair on them. The, 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 um, in English, they would, uh, would be translated into fleeces uh, or furs, as you see there. These are actually very interesting because uh, we can read from the context uh, which are more tanned, more treated than, than the others. Then the most usual occurrences are something that I've, I've, I've there uh, called animal skin terms, where the animal that the, that the skin comes from is indicated in the term as the part of the animal, or it is, okay, it is indicated as an, with an attribute uh, or, or genitive uh, formula. Often we need to know in the context that is, is it really the skin that is meant, or is it some other part of the animal, like for instance, meat. Uh, as I said, uh, if we start reading carefully, we see in the text uh, that there are differences how, uh, how the treatment process goes with the, with the terms. 
here you see uh, what, what I mean. Derma is the very generic uh, term. Then we have, uh, we have raw heights. And what is meant here with this line, it is also very clear in the Greek way of thinking where the treatment goes. So we have the skin is not the same as leather. When we, when we talk about leather, we have skutos or something that is skutinos, leathern. Uh, and then really treated leather is, me, okay, is meant. This di di division is also social and cultural because those people who make, who work with raw heights, they are tanners, uh, those, those traders and artisans, as they would be called, or handicraft uh, traders who work with leather are called uh, 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 those who cut leather. So, so they, they really are not the same. They are more respected. Uh, who, who, who work with something, be making beautiful products, very valued products, shoes or, or, or shields in the Iliad and so on. So we have two ends. We have the really raw end, that the smelly raw end from the skins. And then we have the other one, which is kind of a raffinated uh, end where the really, really leather, really leather is turned into different kinds of uh, products. So we have the term skutotomos. I'm just going here, let's go back to that. So you see, see how we go. The same division is there. Pyrsodepses, and very, 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 sometimes also skulodepses is used. Uh, they are the ones working with the raw side. And then we have skutotomoi, skutotomos, uh, or skuteus, who work with leather. The same is there with the, uh, with the terms of the material itself, as you saw. What is interesting with the, with the skutotomoi, um, they are, of course, leather cutters, and amongst them, the shoemakers are the most talked about leather workers in, Greek, in, in ancient Greek texts. And the, this term skutotomos is most often used as a special meaning denoting to shoemakers regardless of, uh, of being sometimes applied to the fabrication of other leather goods as well. In this continuum, as I said, Pyrsodepsai and Skulodepsai represent uh, respect, uh, respect, uh, respectively the rawest end and the traders working with the raw material uh, uh, animal skins. We do have a special terms for, for people like uh, saddlers or uh, or those who, who make leather furniture, leather furniture even in, in the text. But then usually we have the, uh, the skuto, sku, sku, or, or skutinos, uh, indicated in the terminology as well. If we look at the one example here, uh, where the different the nuances in the people who are working on skins or, or leathers or furs or pelts, this comes from Aristophanes, uh, from Plutus, uh, where he is, the playwright here is rather specific in his use of terms relating to leather processing. Unlike Plato, who, by the way, uh, loved shoemakers. The shoemakers were something that represented him, him uh, the, I, almost the ideal handy, uh, handicraft. So he loved them. But they, uh, here, Aristophanes, who, thanks to his his very strong animosity and personal hatred towards Cleon, the tanner, in many of his plays. The Cleon, whom Aristophanes hated and attacked, was uh, known to, to, as a tanner. He was a, tan he was a tannery owner, or came from the family of a tannery owners, in fact. So that's why the Aristophanes', Aristophanes texts are very rich sources for our knowledge of a, uh, of a tanning terminology relating to tanneries in particular. So here you see that, that this terminology for here is, is uh, integrated with, with those per persons uh, who work with leather production and related professions such as, uh, uh, such as um, um, in, in this case, we have knafeus, and we have those who, who uh, clean um, um, fleeces, we have also tanners make, uh, mentioned there. And then there is an interesting term that has been connected with the leather making processes, paratillein. 
So these all are different things. And he's of course playing, but playing with the words, but just an example how the terminology is very specific. So now, associations with tanners in ancient text are generally negative. The tanners, the tanners were necessary but undesirable group of laborers in, uh, in ancient Greek polis. Uh, at the same time, skutotomoi, leather workers, cobblers in particular, shoemakers that is, regardless of them also falling into so-called banaustic uh, trades, um, which means occupations of manual laborers, where they were well integrated into the fabric of the city and entered even into the philosophical rhetoric. But the, so was not the case like with, the, with the tanners, Pyrsa Debsai. So now uh, here we even have the, have the visual material for, uh, for skutotomoi, who make in this case shoes. These are the archaic vases, beautiful ones, both of them. Uh, with interesting tools there, if you can. If you can see here, let's see, I mean, I tried. So there, there you see the shoes there, the leather, le leather hanging, and, and also some tools and this one. But there's nothing equivalent for, for tanners. We know of these, these kind of vases for many, many different occupations uh, from Greece, but tanners very typically are excluded from these iconographical representations. Various ways to attribute leather or described it indicates, therefore, the existence of leather processing methods would developed towards, were already well developed, but de developed further towards the 5th century BC, when, they, when there was already rather sophisticated knowledge of vegetable tanning and its procedures, as we will very shortly see. There's, there's something quite interesting as well that the notion, notion of savage peoples living in more or less in wilderness who do not know the art of tanning but instead, instead were raw untanned animal, untanned animal hides was therefore a topos to draw a difference between civilized and uncivilized peoples. For instance, Herodotus, uh, for Herodotus, uh, people, he contrasts Pe those peoples who, of course, it, were the, it was the Greeks who, who were more sophisticated, but different uh, barbaric peoples who didn't know yet the art of tanning uh, could be wearing skins of various animals, and some of them, them only skins. So, so that's the kind of a savage and rawness and uh, uncivilized way that is indicated here. Of course, it was the Greeks who were regarded to possess the knowledge of treating the skins into durable leather, and uh, so that's why uh, they were much, be much left be uh, beyond the stages of roughness and the being closeless of, of nature. In some examples, we even have, uh, let's look at the here, uh, there's a rawness, rawhide, something that is adepsetos, not softened for skins, meaning rawness. It's also used in this kind of a symbolic way. Here we have examples from, uh, from Homer, where Odyssey, is, Odyssey has come, come to Ithaca. The suitors had been eaten, uh, had, had the meal of, uh, of, of uh, a huge lot of a goat meat. And uh, Odyssey is in disguise comes to the palace and he's sleeping rough on the, on, the, on the floor. And he's putting the, this uh, raw hide where he's sleeping. On top of that, he, is, he piles some fleeces. And this is to draw the contrast where Penelope is actually, he had, he had to decline the Penelope, Penelope's invitation to sleep in the bed where the tanned nice hides would have been waiting in their own, all of their softness. Of course, this is just to indicate the roughness of the situation as such. There's, an, there's a two occasions in Homer in this kind of a symbolic use of the, what is the raw, what is raw, and what is not. Uh, another one, omoboeios, uh, which is of course meaning, meaning an uh, untanned uh, ox hide, is often used in text like Xenophon and in Herodotus, uh, describing, for instance, the armory for those people who are bar uh, barbaroi. Sometimes even this, uh, this indicate, indication of uh, hairiness, daseon in this case, 
means very much something that is, that is uncivilized, because uh, that just means also something that is rough in a cultural and social sense. Yes. <clears throat> uh, so, there is a, there is a lot of uh, social cultural reson resonances of terminology relating uh, to, uh, to skins and hides and leather in ancient Greek texts. We have this, you, you saw already uh, earlier, this term diphtera, which means treated tanned leather. Diphtera, as we somehow uh, quickly saw, apart from meaning pieces of leather, tanned, treated leather, meant also a simple garment worn by workers and slaves, peasants or poor, probably since as uh, compared to the, to the woven textiles, maybe making clothes from leather was cheaper and simpler. It was thus, the diphtera was therefore also an attribution of servile status and became even a symbolic attribution of inferior population living in servitude and repression. Being clad in leather or simply, hi in, uh, simply hide it in hides is thus a sign of two issues. It is firstly either, uh, it firstly sing signals savage, barbaric, and technically less advanced peoples and tribes uh, than the Greeks, of course, themselves. Um, or then it just uh, uh, refers to poverty, serv uh, uh, peasant status, and servitude. Wearing first uh, was regarded as raw, both in technical and symbolic sense, and hence, uh, hence diphtera uh, wearing people were put on the lowest stage of, uh, of the social scale. It seems clear that the Greeks distinguished between activities, establishments, and persons dealing with leather production and its various stages, and those relating to working uh, readily, uh, uh, readily, uh, readily treated leather. So then, now we turn to the second part. What was actually done? What happens when skin turns into leather? Go back to this one. Uh, skin, generally, uh, the, the three layers that I mentioned earlier, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis, are found in all mammal skin. The purpose of tanning is to permanently alter the structure of the skin by replacing the animal protein in the skin uh, in the skin, and then uh, to result in the flexible, resistant, and strong leather. This is done by targeting the fiber structure uh, of the skin by separating individual fibers and filling the gaps between them with tannins, which comes from, uh, from certain plants rich of uh, tannins. In principle, all the three layers of the skin require different treatment depending on which end product is aimed at, whether it would be cured leather, which is in between the two. two. This is, uh, I'm not going to get into that, that uh, tonight, maybe later on. So if, uh, if we want to have parchment, for instance, it's kind of a bit like a stage in between. So uh, we might want to have a fully tanned leather or then fur. A little bit, principally same thing, that's a little bit different kind of nuances there. Tanned leather constitutes mostly of the dermis layer, and its uh, separated collagen fibers and the gaps between them are, uh, tanned, uh, are filled with tannins, tannin agents. So even, even chemically, that is, uh, the leather is different from skins and hides. And even the layer structure is different. It's important to make difference between what is regarded as true tanning, and that, uh, that means vegetable tanning, and what is regarded as pseudo-tanning, or curing. These terms are bad, right? but, the, but they are actually used, so uh, what can we do? They're a bit uh, misleading in the nature, the terms. So now, vegetable tanning is a rather, it is more complex process than curing. When tannins extracted from plants, rich of them, are not used, we talk about curing, which employs relatively simple methods for delaying the onset of decay of the skins, for example, by smoking application or putting the fat uh, in, just kind of plummeting the fats in. 
uh, uh, using the oils or mineral earth with, okay, with the special tools like nice blades and hammers and screens to beat and scrape and scratch uh, the, uh, the skin to make it more flexible. But it is not so tanned that it would be durable enough uh, or enough uh, waterproof. You know, for instance, parchment is not waterproof. Uh, according to some scholars, the true vegetable tanning uh, cannot, be treated, uh, cannot be traced back much further than the 5th century BC, at least in the archaeological record. But this can be contested, and this, there, this question has, has been talked quite a bit. Uh, the first textual reference to leatherworking methods in ancient literature is in Homer. It's an Iliad. It's actually rather representative a description of fat curing of an oxide, very large oxide, uh, and therefore it describes, describes this sort of a pseudo tanning curing. Here you see it there. Uh, so there's like the men are stretching the big uh, oxide, and the loads of fats are, are plummeted in, in, into it. Actually, stressing uh, skins and height with oil or uh, expose them to smoke uh, to produce this kind of a pseudo tanned leather continued certainly in parallel with vegetable tanning throughout the antiquity. Uh, even our terminology uh, shows that the emergence of a very complex, uh, more organized, even industrial vegetable tanning as a, distant, uh, as a distinct trait in classical period uh, is really reflected in the concepts and terms for the skins, hide, and leather. That's why I think that we can argue that we actually talk about the, uh, the quite developed industry already at the beginning of the, of the classical uh, period, and uh, uh, it just, just hasn't been paid so, so much attention to. The stage is how the, how, how the, how the leather is made. It starts uh, with naturally with fleshing, where uh, the skins um, was relieved, it was washed from all the membranes uh, of the flesh and fats uh, and loose pieces, loose pieces that are not, uh, cannot actually skin. They were re uh, removed before the following stages of the tanning operations uh, to, uh, to free them from all, uh, all uh, parts that, that were disturbing. And, the, and the removing also the dirt, and quite often also salt, because, uh, because salt was used, used to preserve the raw skins before tanning. We know quite a lot about this, but they, we do not have time to go, uh, go, go through the use of salt in tanning as such an interesting field. Of, uh, for this, this day, the stream would, of course, be natural and, ide and, uh, and, and, and uh, ideal, but, uh, but even... Uh, but even, even uh, the quite good uh, water source would serve the purpose. Uh, cisterns, for instance, uh, or even, even in a very smaller scale tanning, uh, the vats, large vats, and, and access to water would do. But then in the, in, in the industrial scale room and tanning, the water source, uh, the canalization is very important. And this is one of the archeological uh, criteria uh, for tanning in general. Then uh, the hair is removed, uh, and this is, this is uh, usually done by, by using alkaline or ammonium solution that at attacks the hair, which can then be wiped off. This is the, these following pictures are from my own experience of, uh, uh, of, of tanning, who are making parchment in this, this case, and I learned actually a lot. Sometimes the literature that you read is where it's different than when you actually have your hands on the skins. This actually is the smelly stage, the removing, the depilation is the so-called smelly stage of tanning, particularly so um, in a, a, if one of the most straightforward and common means of dehairing heights is employed, namely folding and piling, piling them and letting putrefaction set in until the hair loosen, uh, roots loosen. This process uh, was speeded up by using urine or liquid with uh, uh, animal dungs, so uh, smelly stuff. We know that uh, pigeon, 
uh, pitch and droppers were collected in ancient Greece and used as fertilizer, among other animal manure. But pitch and dung is, is, is also an excellent dehairing agent in tanning due to its content of ammonia. Um, keepers of the Temple of Apollo on Delos turned profit, we know, um, uh, into, into sacred uh, treasury by selling the dung, uh, uh, so the shit of birds, actually, copros peristeron, in their devil coat. Uh, they were, there's even some kind of a kilo price, okay, measurements are, are odd as they are, but we, know, but we know the price of a certain amount of pigeon dung from, uh, from, the, uh, from uh, dealers, the sanctuary of Apollo. So uh, there was the revenue even in the sales of Copros Peristeron. And uh, uh, we know of a, of a great uh, big grant devil coat uh, uh, in Greece, uh, in ancient Greece, like we know from the Roman world as well. Pigeon dung was thus collected to be used as fertilizer, but very likely also in tannery operations in Greece. Urine, for its part, contains, uh, contains nitrites, and it was largely utilized as a cleansing agent, uh, as well as fertilizer and medical remedy in Greece. We know that, that of course, the Roman tanneries used uh, urine. These are the kind of iconic examples. In classical Athens, persons called, so they were persons who were called coprologoi. They collected human savage, sewage and waste uh, from, from the streets, removed and disposed it, probably also sold it to be used as fertilizers on the fields nearby. Citizens were obliged to empty the waste and sewage into stationary dumps, which were then periodically cleaned by these copro logoi. It would not be surprising, I think, if urine uh, would have been separately collected for the demand of the tanneries in the classical Greece by the individuals uh, or uh, or the officials appointed uh, uh, to this duty, and uh, for the profit of the seller and the collector. There's this, uh, this special kind of vessel, it's called amis, urinal, for, uh, for particularly for men. There's another urinal for, uh, for, uh, for women called scafon, scafion. Um, it's kind of a handy because it's also, uh, also bearable, this handled one. And, uh, and these apparently were were left out, uh, outdoors and collected. Why not also for, for tanning operations? This, this is something that we have to deduce our information, a little bit combining them. We cannot take the model, the model directly from the Roman world, but, uh, but uh, these are examples where we can be a bit creative. As to the ancients to, um, to loosen here, uh, also mul mulberry leaves um, uh, are mentioned by Theophrastus, early text in this, uh, the, the, um, in this sense. To, um, to, he says that the, that the person that beside the, uh, the tanners used mulberry leaves in their, in their trade. There are some others as well. Uh, we, have a, we have later text, Pliny says that the Greek in Greece as well, uh, uh, as we see the uh, white bryony was used for this purpose. Then the hair itself uh, was, uh, was removed by, uh, manually by scraping the skin with usually two-handled dehairing, uh, dehairing knife, um, kind of iconic tanning knife, like a, a knife. I guess I can just go in here. I'm getting a bit kind of here we go. So uh, a, a, tan, a knife or carver or a wooden beam, uh, a, or over a wooden beam or a bench, usually termed uh, tranos. Actually, this dehairing is simple. When, when the, the dehairing ancients have done their work, the hair gets off quite easily. So it doesn't need, that the, what, what needs work is this, this when the membranes are, when the skins are cleaned. Not so much the, the hair, this where what I'm doing is before the hair is already taken off and then the work starts. These are very iconic, usually it's very masculine stuff. In the, in the, in the medieval, it's a, tanning is very kind of a, iconically masculine. But these days, those people who do tanning with vegetable things, they are quite often women. <laughs> uh, we know names even for the tools of tanners, uh, this carved, uh, curving, uh, dehering knife. It's called smile, even Plato mentions that. Uh, or then we have this semi-circular semi, semi -circular, circular, uh, knife 
for cutting leather, which is which of course also could have been used in uh, in, uh, in uh, tanning processes. There is this, uh, this is also quite early, uh, early Greek vase where, where we have the scutotomos working with the, with, with the tools here. And this is the very known so-called uh, triad of, uh, of a tanning and the leather working tools from Pompeii. So we have terms of them. The, 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 it goes through, uh, through medieval and then we have of course uh, Diderot and the others who, who describe a tanning still the equipment is very much similar. In vegetable tanning, the tannins are made to work their way into the structure of the skin, and this is the last stage of tanning process. This phase was time-consuming and more static, lasting from six months to over a year. The heights were set horizontally on top of one another in, the layers, in, in layers in pits or buds with vegetable tanning materials uh, in between. There's still one, uh, one, uh, one slide for the tools here. These are the, very, the modern traditional tools. Uh, for very large heights, uh, the pits, uh, these are the, now the materials in the Roman world from, uh, from Greece. We didn't have equivalent as yet, at least. Uh, they were used in a rotation way. So these usually groups of four, because then different phases of, uh, of tanning, it's a long process, where some of them, some of the heights have been there for longer, some, some, some sort of period, uh, and they are stirred every now and again with the tanning agents in between. And uh, <clears throat> the tanning in vats and pits, um, uh, tanning vats and pits were set in the ground. It, this is the most suitable uh, for treatment of very large animal skins and hides, as you see there, to produce very strong leathers. Whereas the tanning uh, of small to medium-sized skins could, of course, have been carried out in wooden or clay bats, even. Tannins, uh, which were called pharmaca, uh, these tannin agents, the, uh, the particles of plants, are obtained from plants which uh, produce highly yields of, uh, of, of them, highly yields of tannins. In addition to leaves and barks and fruits of, uh, of such plants, galls uh, were used in ancient Greece as source of tannins. They actually are a pathological ex, uh, excrescences formed in the branches, leaves or domes of plant as a response to the bites of certain insects, most often, or other parasites. And they can contain uh, as much as 60% of tannins. Theophrastus uh, names eight uh, different oak tannins, uh, oak galls used in, uh, in tannin. And interestingly, Chemical Dictionary of Economic Plants uh, from 2000, uh, 2010, I think it was, list, uh, lists uh, 20 tannin plants, eight of them are native or growing in the Mediterranean region. And in ancient Greek texts from classical area already, we have explicit mention of six of these as a tanning plants used in leather tanning. This, I think, it's a, it's a rather valid attestation uh, for, 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 yes, high level and even sophisticated knowledge of tannins already in ancient uh, classical, early classical times. Theophrastus, who was writing, uh, writing uh, the classical, uh, towards the, the end of the classical era, um, his writings on plants are an important source uh, on the tannins used in ancient Greece. He mentions uh, that the sources for tanners in their operations can be grouped into galls, bark, and, and fruits. And he discusses uh, especially oak galls, uh, as you saw there, uh, oak barks and swimmock leaves. Here it is not meant to be seen, but you just, yeah, I have, uh, uh, I have just collected, actually it's a bit, a bit blurry, collected these plants that we ha find, find in ancient Greek sources and uh, which uh, are very, uh, which ta uh, tannin, tannin plants. In many cases they are explicitly mentioned to, be ha to have been used by tanners in Greece. So then, we go to the last part of, uh, of the talk. Let's see how we are in the time. Yes. Uh, so, where, 
where, do, like, where do, did the heights come from for tanning increase? Where were the tanneries themselves situated? Now, echoing the old argument that most meat consumed by the ancient, uh, ancient Greeks uh, was during the religious festivals, fe festivals and had connection with sacrifice, it has also been claimed uh, that uh, goods related to meat, such as suets, hides, and the sinews, most often had their origins in the cultic activity, originating in sanctuaries and uh, uh, a ritual context. However, I think that, the, uh, that as, as it is with the meat, and this has been shown many times, uh, the, with meat and meat consumption, there is no reason to believe that all leather for tanning originated in sanctuaries, but sacrificial contexts seem nevertheless to have been a significant provider of hides and skins for leather production, alongside with the regulated methods, such as, of course, hunting, farmhouse pr pr processing, of hides and skins for, for uh, own or small consumptions. By classical times, commercial tanning had become a quite a substantial and profitable trade in Greece. Producing this common, com a commodity was an important component in the police econ economy and within the creation of the, of the skin, uh, in the, sac uh, the creation of the skin in sacrificial ritual, it ensured also the e economic viability of animal sacrifice and, hen and hence supported the, e uh, the continuation of temple economy. Oops, there were still some plants. Look. Yes, we have, a, we, we have the plants make, uh, mentioned by, uh, by Theophrastus. Useful for tanning hides, we have Aleppo uh, gulls. And one of the most used tanning, uh, tanning sources still today uh, is this kind of oak, very usual uh, Aleppo pine in Greece, which he also mentions. This is interesting. Uh, this is Fus, it's sumac, which is, a, which is the Mediterranean plant, was also used as a, uh, as a colorant. So Theophrastus tells that, that, they, that the tanners were also uh, coloring their heights at the same time. Makes sense. Once you have a good tanning plant, why, and, it, and it gives you a color, why not use it? It's an interesting plant, this one. So we go to sacrificial uh, context with this, uh, the, the, uh, this image. Namely, shifting, if, we, if we shift our attention uh, from meat to hides in sacrificial uh, context, it even may alter our perception of a sanctuary site, since the presence of hides must have been concrete and really concrete and very uh, uh, really concrete fact there, uh, because they take space. An average bull hide uh, weighs an average uh, weighs something like uh, 35 kilos. An average cattle hide uh, 30 kilos, and so we go to the smaller animals. And they are very large. If you can see here, this gives a kind of a visual image that they are large. Uh, for instance, a bull hide uh, is from four and a half meters to five and a half uh, half square meters. If you, we have, the, have, have the tens of full, uh, full grown uh, oxen sacrificed, you can imagine how the sanctuary would look like. In the Homeric hymn to Hermes, uh, Hermes actually is busy sacrificing two, two horned, big, wonderful cow, uh, cows. He first kills them, then he cuts, uh, cuts up the rich fattened meat and roasts the flesh uh, with the punch of, uh, of, uh, of the blood. As the last task, he lays them upon the ground and spreads uh, them as the hides uh, on them. So even in this scene of a very archetypal sac sacrifice, the hides are freshly, uh, the, the hides are very, they have their presence there. They are, uh, they are everywhere, they're very physically present. Then him goes on and saying that actually the heights are still there as a reminder, so they had their meaning. Now, particularly in the major sanctuaries in Greece, which regularly employed the large-scale animal sacrifices, the sheer amount of heights of animal skins could also have been significant. We have this epithetoitheo uh, eortai, which were big uh, sacrificial rituals. We have uh, we, we have um, epigraphical records. <coughs> 
on the amount of heights, dermata, which were then sold out. Later on, we have an example of the Dermaticon accounts from the time of Lycurgos, who was very consciously using uh, the sale of heights for the benefit uh, uh, of his treasury, and also developing the sanctuaries in, Attica, uh, in Athens and Attica and elsewhere. The prices are high. They really are. The, de uh, the heights, uh, the skins, Dermata, were the valuable stuff. We have thousands of drachma mentioned in these, uh, the, the, these uh, epigraphical evidence, this is alone. Then, of course, the priest and other important person profited it a fair deal by selling the skins they had been granted. It was a privilege. Uh, the granting the skin was the first, uh, first uh, Hiroshima or Gera. There is a difference between the amounts of, uh, of skins from official sacrifices and those of the private cults. And it seems that that were the very large, uh, the, the heights for later use, they usually come from the official big sacrifices, whereas the small, more private, uh, uh, private sacrifices, then we do not know so much about the fate of them. Uh, yes. Sacrifi sacrificial context and, and sanctuaries um, as source of skins uh, for tanning made us then to ask, where were the tanneries? In fact, uh, those very secure epigraphically, uh, epigraphically attested tanneries in Greece had a connection with sanctuaries. I present you the, then, then to the end, two of them. We have a very long inscription here uh, from Halaesa, uh, Alessa, in Sicily. Uh, it's dated to, uh, to appro approximately 300 uh, BC or a bit later, or somewhat later. It's a long text that records the, rule, uh, uh, records the rules of a property and land boundaries, sub subdivision lines, buildings, uh, and related details within the sanctuary of Apollo, Zeus, Melikios, and Adranos. It locates an, existing, uh, an already existing Mageirikon and specifies the subdivisions of an area in and around the terminus. Now the demarcations of the Nars are given, uh, are given in detail, and then it is stated that, uh, that no, do not, you are not, and no one is uh, allowed to establish a tannery next to, uh, next to uh, Magerigon, which is the kind of a butchery kitchen where apparently meat was cut. So it would, would, would make sense that the tannery where the heights were first treated would have been there as well. So prohibiting the tannery and Mayerikon together had a concept in this case. There was the river and they, there was also existing uh, drainage. So the, the, uh, the water source together with the big road would have made a very good site, site for the tannery. Raw material from the sanctuary and the fields uh, around water and the road, as well as possibly oak bark for tanning from the large oak forest around, uh, 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 would make a very good statistics or logistics for the tannery. We can only speculate on the reasons why to pan the tannery and my in Halaesa. Nasty smells, of course, being uh, one possibility. But there's also, uh, also the vicinity of the temple, which is uh, mentioned here. The, this inscription states that uh, the olive trees, uh, which there you see in the end, uh, the, the olive, uh, olive tree, trees were sacred. That means that they were property of the gods. So now the tannery would have made a bit of a polluting, the pollu polluting effect on those sacred olive trees, probably. Uh, the one, uh, this comes from Greece, this is quite, uh, this is known as the tanning, uh, tannery degree or tanning, uh, or tanner degree from Athens, dated to 440 to 4, 430 BC. Uh, this text forbids, uh, usually uh, the tannery uh, epigraphy is something that you should not do. So we, we get to know about tanning by, by getting to know what there is not, or what should there not be. Uh, this, this one pro, uh, forbids anyone to tan heights or dip, uh, dip them in the river Ilysses above the sanctuary of Heracles, or to throw rubbish into the river Ilysses. And uh, it attests the connection of the raw material for tanning operations by Ilysses 
with, uh, with the sanctuary of Heracles. The aim was obviously to prevent the river from being polluted by Katharmata, which is there mentioned in the text. Um, the location of the sanctuary of Heracles, close to the river Ilysses, uh, and that of the gymnasium of Gynosarkes, have been debated for in scholarship for uh, for ages since the, since, the 19, since the early 19th century. Now we do not know the exact location of the shrine of Heracles mentioned in this text. Um, and we, we, we are not going to speculate on that either here. Uh, nevertheless, the, the, our associations for the ban to pollute uh, the water with the tannery waste would be, we would think, environmental, wouldn't it? Environmental concerns. Because we could connect this text with the risk to save the bucolic Ilysses Valley from the disturbing waste from the tannery. It has also been argued that the degree was connected with the activities of the washers operating nearby with the intention to protect the purity of the water of the river uh, for their work. This argumentation is partly based on this mid-century BC relief, separated by, uh, into two parts, uh, and there's an inscription uh, naming the washers who dedicate, dedicate uh, this, uh, this relief uh, to the gods, uh, Archelo, Pan, Archelos, Nymphs, and the other gods. The scene, as you see, is a grotto uh, uh, there. So now, and it is from, from the same location around uh, by the Ilysses. Now, the traders of tanners, fullers, and even washers were, in fact, loosely related crafts, requiring partly similar premises and processing substances. And hence, it could, be, it could have been logical that these traders operated in the, in the close vicinity from one another. However, of course, we know that none of these branches were in fact clean in the same sense in the modern associations of cleanliness, uh, which would be sending nicely fresh or sterilizing unhealthy particles, etc., etc., etc. Et et but in everyday realities, heights were, uh, were uh, tanned, uh, heights from Heracles' sanctuary were tanned by the, the Ilysses, wool was fulled, um, and uh, clothes were washed using urine, uh, on the banks of the river. So what was then this role of the katharmata, which were, men, which were mentioned there in this inscription? The katharmata, it would, might, as tempting as it might be to connect this katharmata to the religious purity ideology of the Greeks and speculate on the concept of sacred in more general uh, in more general, since katharmata were the import of screwings, refuse of a sacrifice, which had to be thrown away uh, in cleaning, so the, in the purity kind of way of thinking. But I would actually uh, rather regard this katharmata simply as harmful, quite concretely polluting nuisance dirt. Uh, the heights after sacrificial rituals over, were literally harmful and could be toxic, including potentially polluting waste, which had to be cleansed away, as what the katharmata implies. There is, in, in this term, there is, there, there is the uh, close relation between pure and impure and, and their relation. But uh, as I said, uh, there would have been something that had to be simply kept clean. The, um, uh, for instance, byproducts of tanning that Theophrastus, for instance, men mentions, uh, were also fertilizers. They were the mixture of urine, animal dung, and those agents that the tanners left behind. So if you, th these were used, of course, it was the smelly stuff. It was polluting in a very concrete sense. Yes. So what, I, what I'm saying here, the, it, it's not always necessarily that this pure, impure dichotomy would have pertained to tanning, tanning all over, uh, or handling of the animal skins in ancient uh, world view. On the contrary, with the religious ideological world view, tanning can be seen, and often, uh, uh, if, we, if, if we so wished, effect, effectively as a cleansing process. And so this is, uh, this is where I, just now, I'm not going to give you any more, uh, uh, three minutes, because then I'm going to finish by just wondering a little bit what might actually be this so-called sacrificial leather. 
uh, it would be nice to think of, of, some, of uh, something like sacred leather. But we have to be careful uh, with this one. And this is when we ponder on whether leather originating from sacrificial context was perceived differently uh, as, uh, in ancient Greece uh, as that leather which did not have association with any kind of sacredness. We have epigraphical mentions uh, which points to the perception of sacrificial leather although a few regulations prohibit, uh, uh, there are other re regulations which prohibit clothing items made of leathers of certain animals, usually of goat or big pig. Pig leather was kind of a no-go in the sanctuary context easily. Here we have the Andanian rule. It's an inscription uh, from, uh, from 90 BC regulating the mysteries of Messenia, uh, in Messenia and stipulating that no woman in the sanctuary is to wear sandals unless they are made of felt or leather or hide from a, from a sacrificial victim. You see it there uh, in a different color. Uh, yes. The leather here is not sacred leather, but it literally is leather made of sacrificial hide, which itself not, was not sacred when taken out of the sanctuary. This prohibition, the, the prohibi prohibition of leather in general in sanctuary displayed in a couple of regulations, other regulations, has been regarded as reference to its supposed impure nature by its association with death or to the supposed impure origin in non-ritually sacrificed animals. Here again, I would be cautious to, to, to go too far uh, and be sure that, that we are not mixing up sacred and what is the sacrificial leather. It seems that the leather, that which ori originated in sacrificial ritual, was generally regarded, if not special, at least distinguished from a lesser quality leather. This is because uh, sacrificial victims had to be perfect specimens, healthy, without blemish, as we know. And, as we've seen earlier, uh, for example, lesser quality pork skin, pig skin, that is, would not uh, have originated in sanctuaries. The situation is the same as with meat. Meat from sacrificial uh, victims uh, or animals was a highly regarded community, community, co commodity, often sold separately on the market, and the meat of these animals was de de designated as meat of hiero tuta. Hence the leather of the sandals of the, uh, this rule from Andania, Andanian Mysteries, uh, in, in this rule, the leather is not sacred here on, but simply made of here or tuta. We would take a little bit of an imaginary freedom and could imagine us strolling through the ancient Athenian agora, where we would maybe pass a shoemaker's shop or workshop. It could be possible there to have the sign on some of these workshops saying that uh, good quality shoes here sold, the best material guaranteed. My material comes from the sacrifi sa sacrificial victims. The leather, leather is good, hey? Here you get it. Uh, so also the shoemakers could uh, price his items highly as material would be the best quality with added value of leather from sacrificial victims to guarantee their worth. If you have questions, I, uh, I have a little bit, I have worked also on putting together the criteria how to identify tannery archaeologically in, uh, in ancient uh, Greek uh, contexts. We can discuss them later on. I'm not going to make you sit there for too long because I could, I could go and bubble forever on this. So now please do, if you think, Ria, that we have time for, for questions. Uh, and then we can, of course, continue talking. In other ways, too.